Somebody asked me uh, before uh, the service, uh, the first service, if I had put together any kind of, uh, say, outline or something that shows a point, counterpoint kind of discussion of Mormonism versus, say, Presbyterian beliefs and so on. I have not done that. Um, However, the uh, books that I recommended last week, which are available from the Presbyterian Church, uh, actually, as I understand it from Julie uh, Griffin, there is that kind of outline in those uh, books. And so if you wanted a resource that would be something of a comparative analysis, the Mormons believe this, uh, Presbyterians believe that, you know, kind of thing in a summary sort of way, then uh, that would be the place to go. Just go to the uh, Presbyterian Church um, website, which is uh, pcusa.org, and then just start poking around, and you know, if you are accustomed to playing around on the internet, you'll find it eventually. And they're not expensive, and you might order uh, several thousand of them and pass them out to your friends, that sort of thing. <laughs> so uh, that's uh, that's my suggestion there. <laughs> you know, there's a there's a bunch. Aren't there a bunch back here? Uh, I just had a fistful that I. There should be quite a few. Um, so before we. Uh, Cut down any more pine trees. I think I made. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Don. Uh, this morning, uh, as you know, we're coming to the last of our series, a short series on understanding Mormonism. Uh, this is by no means uh, an exhaustive or uh, adequate treatment, but the three weeks that we've devoted to it is as much as we thought was appropriate for a course such as this. So uh, this is going to do it. Um, if uh, you were, uh, you're aware that next week this class will not meet at all, the congregational meeting takes place in the uh, hour that uh, would ordinarily be uh, adult education. The week after that, uh, we'll be starting a new series in here. If you're interested, it'll be a, a short, quick, running uh, survey of Paul's letters. Uh, the letters of Paul in the New Testament, taking them in chronological order. So we're going to be constructing a brief analysis of Paul's major writings in the New Testament, especially focusing on the place he was, uh, the people to whom he was writing, the historical background. It won't be so much an exegetical kind of approach or a verse-by-verse sort of thing. We'll probably spend one or two weeks on each letter, so it'll go pretty fast, just a fly-low kind of quick survey, uh, trying to put these letters into their historical setting and see what the issues were and why Paul address the issues quite the way he did in those uh, documents. So that's going to be our uh, project for the spring. The first Sunday of February we'll start that and that'll carry through then uh, through the rest of the church school year. Uh, Next fall, I'm not quite sure what we'll be doing, but I have had uh, some rumblings about doing some other presentations on alternative religions. Uh, And so it would be not necessarily Mormonism, but maybe Jehovah's Witnesses or something on that order. I'm not sure that's what we'll do. Uh, And so I'm just indicating to you that uh, that's been suggested and... um, Uh, That thought is out there. But in any event, this morning, uh, we want to come back then to the question of uh, Mormonism and really, this morning, take up what is, in my estimation, by far the most difficult of all of the subjects that we're going to be treating, which is Mormon theology as such, uh, and trying to do something of a casual comparison of what has been Mormon belief and what it is today and possibly even projecting a little bit of where it's going uh, with respect to the benchmark we're using at least of what we would consider to be classical Orthodox Christianity and particularly as we find it uh, in the Presbyterian flavor of uh, traditional Christianity. Uh, So that's... uh, a little more challenging than just doing the historical survey that we've done in past weeks, but obviously a series like this would hardly be complete if we didn't uh, undertake uh, that kind of discussion. So, uh, that's what's before us this morning. Let's, uh, let's have a word of prayer and we will get underway. Our Father, we are grateful that you give us this privilege of gathering together here and continuing our conversation about these matters that have to do with uh, friends of ours, often family members, people who are committed deeply and uh, sincerely to a religious system, uh, which at the same time uh, we have uh, found to be 
uh, different from and uh, in fact falls short of what we believe to be the standards of biblical truth. We pray, however, that our conversation would be seasoned with the deepest sense of your grace and mercy and that we would not in any sense be driven by uh, motives that would be uh, to condemn or to uh, bash or to be destructive, but rather that all of this would be uh, salted with your grace and uh, driven by the goodness that is in Christ. We give you thanks for it in Jesus' name. Amen. I appreciate it very much. Uh, Janine's sermon this morning. I thought it was very timely because obviously any time uh, we start taking up subjects such as this where we are actually engaged in something of a critique of other people, you know, uh, it's easy for that to drift into something somewhat more malicious. And uh, that has not been my interest or uh, ambition in making this presentation. Uh, we all have family, friends, close relatives. Some of us ourselves have come out of uh, Mormon backgrounds and have uh, close associations with folks that we may have left behind in that community. And I'm aware I've had at least a couple of folks come to me after and, and basically say they still are Mormons. They were just here, you know, for interest uh, in this presentation. So, uh, And that may be you this morning. So I just want to make it clear for the record right off the bat that uh, this is not intended in any sense to be some sort of shot, you know, a torpedo or anything like that, uh, but rather it is hopefully a way in which we who are Presbyterians and Christians can learn to uh, reach out more intelligently to our Mormon friends and have conversations with them that are at least uh, somewhat better informed than they might have been otherwise. And that's my hope, that's my ambition, uh, and I, I'm uh, hopeful that my own attitude and style in making this presentation has been, uh, has been consistent with that. Uh, having said that, I need to say at the same time now that this will probably be the presentation that will seem the most critical. Because, in fact, this is the point where we are having to make some distinctions and say, here's what Mormons have believed, uh, at this point seem to believe, and here is where it seems different from that which we as uh, Presbyterian Christians and even just in the classical uh, tradition of Christianity have believed to be the case. And obviously there's differences. Uh, if, if there weren't differences, we wouldn't be having this conversation. And obviously we also believe, uh, at least I'm Presbyterian, I'm not a Mormon, you know, so that uh, by necessary inference means I think I'm right. And I think that there's some people who are mistaken, you know. And so I want to say this charitably, lovingly, but at the same time I think in the spirit of fairness it has to be pointed out. There are differences, and those differences, as it stands right now, in my estimation, are irreconcilable. That the, the Mormonism is not simply another branch of the Christian faith, but in fact there are some deep and significant differences that, that remain uh, just uh, huge in terms of trying to uh, correlate these two uh, ways of understanding uh, Christian truth. Analyzing Mormon theology is difficult because it has been a bit of a moving target. And I think if you have a Mormon background and you're reasonably well informed, you will grant that point. Uh, Mormon theology does not affirm today exactly the same thing that Brigham Young said or Joseph Smith said. There have been changes. There has been a substantial evolution in Mormon theology. And I'm happy to say that movement has tended to be toward Orthodox Christianity. Okay. I don't want to overstate that. But it has not been a movement away from orthodoxy. Every change that has taken place, as far as I can tell, has been where Mormonism has given up something that was, uh, that was really viewed as seriously deviant from biblical teaching and has moved generally in a direction that would, we, we would consider more consistent with biblical teaching. But like I said, I don't want to overstate that. So if Mormonism was once a million miles away, it's like now it's 900,000 miles away. You see, it's, it's, it's moving in the right direction. Uh, but there's still huge differences. And so I just want to make clear that, that I, I'm happy with the trajectory of the movement. At the same time, I don't want to be sanguine and say that, well, you know, the, 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 everything's fine and there's no problem anymore. Uh, so anyway, with, with all of that uh, preamble, uh, let's just take a look at this. My, my plan this morning is just to move rapidly through the major branches of theological subject matter and just to try to do a, a rather brief and casual uh, discussion of the way in which uh, both Mormons have seen these ideas and the way we have viewed them in the confines of what I'm calling classical orthodoxy. 
Now, when I use the word classical orthodoxy, I simply mean this. All three branches of the, of, of the Christian church worldwide, the Eastern Orthodox Church, the Roman Catholic Church, and Protestant communities, including this one, would go back to classical formulations as to the nature of God, the nature of Christ, and related matters. We would, for example, go back to the Nicene Creed, 325 uh, A.D., it is still a creedal statement that we all embrace. It hasn't gone anywhere. We're not going anywhere. Our understanding of it has deepened, but it has not deviated from that. And so when I talk about classical orthodoxy, I mean a kind of Nicene understanding, let's say, of the nature of God, the Trinity. Or when I talk about the classically orthodox view of Christ, I mean what was spelled out at the Council of Chalcedon in 451, where the church affirmed that Christ is two natures in one person, and uh, that those two natures come together in that one person perfectly, but the two natures retain their own attributes. Christ is both on the one hand fully God, truly God, and at the same time truly man. And th that would be classical orthodoxy. All branches of the church embrace that, you see. So what, what I'm saying is we have not been such a moving target because we've had that sort of benchmark. And when I use that term, that's what I'm referring to. Uh, but when I use the term classical orthodoxy, that's what I have in mind. All right. Well, what, uh, what do we make of the Mormon view of the nature of God? At its beginning, when, for example, uh, Joseph Smith uh, first delivered to us the Book of Mormon, uh, if you were to look in that writing, you would find very little that would actually appear to be theological in character. It is a story as I was intimating to you the first week we were together. There are, however, theological comments here and there, and for the most part, they would not be highly offensive, probably to uh, anyone in the tradition of classical orthodoxy. For example, if you were to read uh, 3rd Nephi 11.27, from the Book of Mormon, you'd read these words, quote, from, uh, purportedly from Jesus. Verily I say to you that the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost are one, and I am in the Father, and the Father in me, and the Father and I are one. Let's see. Well, if that's what the Mormons said on the subject, we wouldn't be having this conversation. You see, we'd be saying, well, this is, this, there's no problem. That really is pretty consistent with a traditional Trinitarian formulation of the nature of God. It seems to strongly imply the deity of Christ. Uh, it seems to uh, give us an idea of monotheism. And all of those would be fairly compatible, obviously, with what uh, uh, we would otherwise hold to be true. However, that's not the whole story. You see, even by the end of the life of Joseph Smith, we have some considerable departure from a statement even such as the one I just read to you. Probably the most famous example of this is from the so-called King Follett Discourse. King Follett was uh, a guy who died. This was a, a funeral oration that Joseph Smith... He was not a king. This was just his first name. You know, King Follett. That was his name. Uh, but anyway, at his funeral, uh, Joseph Smith made the following statement. And this is footnote one then in my handout. Uh, and it goes like this. Uh, this is from Joseph Smith. The year is 1844. Quote, First, God himself, who sits enthroned in yonder heavens, is a man like unto one of yourselves. That is the great secret. I'm going to tell you how God came to be God. We've imagined that God was God from all eternity. God himself, the Father of us all, dwelt on an earth the same as Jesus Christ himself did. You have got to learn how to be gods yourselves. See. Now, a statement like that makes us a little nervous, uh, because that would not be at all compatible, as I'm sure you're aware, with traditional uh, understandings of the nature of God, the nature of the Trinity, uh, or the nature of man. Brigham Young expanded on that idea and had uh, other things to say on it that were basically uh, consistent with it. So, for example, at footnote 2, I have this uh, quote, then, uh, or at least a reference uh, for this quote from Brigham Young. Uh, quote, God is our Father, the Father of our spirits, and was once a man. 
in mortal flesh as we are and is now an exalted being. How many gods there are, I do not know. But there never was a time when there were not gods. God has once been a finite being. So again, in uh, Brigham Young's, at least, statements, you have an idea that would be utterly incompatible, honestly, with the classically orthodox understanding of the nature of God. Brigham Young, of course, also made clear, and this does continue to be Mormon teaching to this day, that salvation involves a process in which you are fundamentally deified. You can become God. So at footnote 3, this reference again, uh, which is taken from um, Brigham Young, uh, he said, quote, We are created to become gods, like unto our Father in heaven. Man is the king of kings and lord of lords in embryo. Uh, And that really is a really a fundamental idea in Mormonism, that there's a kind of uh, exaltation that takes place in which by the process of salvation you are exalted into something like the status of deity. Probably the most important Mormon theologian of the 20th century is a man by the name of Bruce McConkie. I would highly recommend you read his work. I've cited it. It's in the bibliography I've provided to you there. It continues to be probably the definitive work for Mormon theology today. And so, uh, and it does represent some great adjustments from what you would read, for example, in Brigham Young or Joseph Smith. But uh, it is probably the authoritative work that's out there uh, today. Bruce McConkie says, uh, this is at footnote 4, uh, the following. Quote, Indeed, this doctrine of plurality of gods is so comprehensive and glorious that it reaches out and embraces every exalted personage. Those who attain exaltation are gods. So again, you have an idea here, you see, that there is a plurality of deities and that you yourself have the potentiality to become deity and indeed, as we'll see, uh, to be worshipped as such by a population of people who would recognize you as deity. Uh, and so it's, you know, at that point, you just have to say, this, th- there's no way we can connect those dots, you see. That, this would be abhorrent, really, to classical Christian teaching. There's, there's just no conceivable way to reconcile those views. I don't know of any way to do it, and that's why, from the point of view of traditional Christianity, we've had some concern about Mormon teaching on this particular point just because the authoritative spokespeople out there are making those kinds of statements and and it raises those kinds of alarm bells. Another point at which uh, Mormon theology uh, is different from classical orthodoxy would be the affirmation that God himself, God the Father, we would say, has a physical body. Uh, For example, and this is at uh, footnote 5, Uh, This is in Doctrine and Covenants, quote, The Father has a body of flesh and bones as tangible as man's. The Son also, but the Holy Spirit has not a body of flesh and bones, but is a personage of spirit. Were it not so, the Holy Ghost uh, could not dwell in us. So we have this idea then that God is not only an evolving kind of being, Uh, over time, having evolved from humanity to deity, but also that God still retains, in a sense, a human nature, at least insofar as he has a physical body. Um, Probably one of the more controversial points of Mormon teaching, which has been abandoned. So this would not be Mormon teaching today. Bruce McConkie would disavow this, but it was affirmed strongly by Brigham Young, is that the God that we worship was once, in fact, Adam in the Garden of Eden, you see. Uh, For example, at uh, footnote 6, I make reference to this, which is um, from uh, Brigham Young. Quote, When our father Adam came in the Garden of Eden, he came into it with a celestial body and brought Eve, one of his wives, with him. He helped to make and organize uh, this world. He is Michael the archangel, the ancient of days, about whom holy men have written and spoken. He is our father and our God, the only God with whom we have to do. Uh, Now again, uh, what I'm saying is Mormonism does not teach that anymore. 
That's a point, you see, where they've moved toward orthodoxy. That's a, that's a good step in the right direction. They do not identify the God we worship with Adam who was in the Garden of Eden. But you can see that's kind of where it was coming from, you know, and, and that's uh, in itself somewhat significant. Certainly, however, in spite of that minor uh, and, and really positive adjustment, polytheism is still very much a part of the Mormon cosmology and its uh, theology. Uh, the idea uh, certainly at least is out there that uh, there is a possibility of various gods being worshipped by various populations throughout the universe or possibly, as McConkie speculates, through multiple universes so that uh, there is a, a plurality of deities and a plurality of worshipping communities uh, throughout all of, uh, uh, all of reality. Uh, the God that we worship here uh, on this planet is named Elohim. Uh, that, of course, is a biblical word. That's a Hebrew word for God, literally gods, but it's used in the Hebrew sense to refer to the ultimate God. The Mormons use that name to refer to uh, the God that we worship, and they say of him that he has an eternal celestial wife. So there is Elohim and there is his wife, and they have born offspring who are spiritual offspring. Uh, so the celestial father and mother bear, as it were, spirit children who are awaiting the opportunity to be born of physical human parents and begin their own process of growth and maturity and exaltation and hopefully deification. So the idea is you've got two sets of parents, this, this heavenly parents and the earthly parents within the view of uh, Mormonism. Milton Hunter, uh, this is at footnote 7. Uh, who was a uh, high Mormon official, Milton Hunter, said, quote, The stupendous truth of the existence of a heavenly mother as well as a heavenly father became established facts in Mormon theology. Uh, and so that idea that there is that kind of couple, you see, that uh, reign over this planet. Where does Jesus Christ fit in? Well, Jesus is the firstborn child of Elohim and his celestial wife. The firstborn is Jesus. Uh, and then Jesus was eventually born as a human being uh, into life on this planet. At footnote 8, uh, the following comment, this is from Orson Pratt, who was a Mormon apostle. Quote, Hence the Virgin Mary must have been, for the time being, the lawful wife... I'm sorry, I started the quote a little... Uh, let me just back up. Uh, Orson Pratt was, uh, was, in, was indicating at this point that Elohim was the father of Jesus as the firstborn spiritual son, and then Elohim was also the father of Jesus as his earthly father, and that came by virtue of his uh, relationship with Mary. So again from Orson Pratt, the following, quote, The fleshly body of Jesus required a mother as well as a father. Hence the Virgin Mary must have been, for the time being, the lawful wife of God the Father. You see, uh, if you follow that, the idea then that there is an act of sexual intercourse that takes place between Elohim and Mary. And it's out of that that uh, Jesus himself was born. Uh, that suggests, of course, that uh, Jesus was born not by a virgin birth, as traditional Christianity has maintained, but uh, that for a time uh, Elohim actually took Mary as his wife, and hence there, at least by inference, is a denial of the uh, virgin birth. And at footnote 10, uh, the following. This, I believe, is from uh, Doctrine and Covenants. Is that right? No, this is from Joseph Fielding Smith, a descendant of Joseph Smith. Uh, the birth of the Savior was a natural occurrence unattended by any degree of mysticism, and the Father God was the literal parent of Jesus in the flesh as well as in the spirit. So again, uh, basically a denial of the notion of a virgin birth. Now, having said all of that, I'm going to leave this discussion of the nature of God at this point, but uh, I know that many of you have uh, talked to Mormon folks who have had Mormon missionaries at your door, as I have from time to time, and uh, they are quick to say these days, we believe in the Trinity. Uh, that was not always the case. Mormonism at one time disavowed the term Trinity. 
Uh, Brigham Young wouldn't use that word, but, uh, but nevertheless it has come to be, it has come to have currency within the Mormon community. The uh, caution that we have to raise here is, you know, what the, the, the word Trinity obviously can mean more than one thing. Uh, if Trinity means what we understand to be the Nicene formulation of it, then that would be quite incompatible with the fundamental tenets of the Mormon view as at least we understand them from the writings that are available. And so even though there may be an affirmation of Trinity, uh, we need to be very cautious that the way in which that word is used, the definitions that are attached to it, uh, seem to be strikingly different from those that would be part of uh, our, our traditional understanding there. All right. Some other uh, points just to uh, touch on here uh, as we go along. The Mormon view of the Bible. Um, first of all, the Bible is an official Mormon scripture. They include it among their scriptures, but they have been uh, uh, quick to point out that the Bible is not necessarily binding on later generations. For example, the Book of Mormon itself says this, quote, this is page 101, uh, quote, Because ye have a Bible, ye need not suppose that it contains all my words, nor need ye suppose that I have not caused more to be written. So an idea that the Bible is there, it's important, but it's not necessarily with a, with a long-term binding effect. Orson Pratt said, quote, It is not binding at all upon those who were dead and gone be, uh, before it came. Neither will it be binding upon any generation which shall come after, unless God should raise up men and send them with the same gospel. Uh, so again, the notion that the Bible has some importance but uh, it's a somewhat limited importance. I've often heard, I've had Mormon people say to me uh, this word, well, we believe the Bible, but only insofar as it was correctly translated. If you've ever heard that uh, statement, Orson Pratt, for example, said, quote, Who knows that even one verse of the Bible has escaped pollution so as to convey the same sense now that it did in the original? Now, I'm, if you'll pardon me, I'm going to drop to a footnote and just tell you on the side, that makes me a little crazy. Um, this, um, you know, there is no, I'm going to tell you, I don't think I am stand in fear of contradiction from anybody, anywhere. There is no book in the history of the world that has been subjected to more painstaking concern for accurate translation. There are libraries, thousands upon thousands of scholarly volumes and treatises analyzing some of the most innocuous little points of translation of the New Testament. And, uh, you know, this, this, in other words, is simply not a really reasonable or rational way to just be dismissive about the Bible, to say it's only correct insofar as it's uh, correctly translated. Uh, okay, I'll just leave it at that, but I uh, just want to make that passing remark. I think you're aware that Mormon, uh, uh, the Mormon Church uh, also affirms other writings besides the Bible. So, along with the Bible, You've got three other major sacred writings. These are the Book of Mormon, as we uh, talked uh, the first week, the Pearl of Great Price, which itself incorporates uh, several other documents. For example, the Book of Abraham that I mentioned is in the Pearl of Great Price, and also Doctrine and Covenants. Uh, the Book of Mormon, of course, as we indicated the first time out, was uh, really a story of a uh, Jewish person coming over to the New World, or coming over to Central America, really, I should say, and a whole a series of events that took place there. I'll simply say this uh, in further comment about the Book of Mormon. Uh, there has been a significant amount of effort to try to find historical justification or evidence to support the story that's found in the Book of Mormon. Essentially, the efforts have been... Uh, have been uh, Unsuccessful. Uh, there has not been any uh, significant evidence to verify any of the major teachings of the Book of Mormon, and most Mormons, at least who are informed on the subject, recognize that. They have sponsored some of those expeditions and uh, have come up wanting. You will find contemporary Mormons who are schooled in these matters will often say that it's not so much whether it was historically true, it's the, it's the message that counts, you see and kind of distancing themselves a little bit 
from a notion that that's real history, even though traditionally it was viewed to be that. It strikes me as very similar to what happens in some quarters of the Christian church, where you'll find kind of liberal spirits will say, well, it's not so much what the Bible says in terms of whether it's real history, it's the message, you know, you'll get that. Um, I, I have to say I view that liberal move in Mormonism as a good thing. I'm not so sure I view it as a good thing in, you know, in, in Christian circles, but that's a different topic. Um, uh, so anyway, Doctrine of Covenants we mentioned earlier, that's essentially a compilation of revelations given principally to Joseph Smith and others. So uh, basically that's where we are in terms of uh, Mormon writings and uh, the view of the scripture. Who is Christ? Uh, we indicated earlier that Jesus is viewed as the one who was the firstborn uh, spirit child of Elohim and his celestial wife. Uh, uh, Brigham Young said, Journal of Discourses, volume 1, page 50, quote, When the Virgin Mary conceived the child Jesus, the Father had begotten him in his own likeness. He was not begotten by the Holy Ghost. And who is the Father? He is the first of the human family. Jesus, our elder brother, was begotten in the flesh by the same character that was in the Garden of Eden, who was our Father in heaven. Now, as I indicated to you, uh, the Mormons have, have stepped away from the view that God was Adam, but uh, that idea that uh, Jesus was born first of the celestial pair and then was born physically at a later time continues to be good Mormon teaching. Jesus is, as at least traditionally broadly viewed, as having been a polygamist. For example, um, Orson Hyde said in Journal of Discourses, volume 2, page 80, quote, We say that Jesus Christ, who was married at Cana to the Marys and Martha. And so the marriage at Cana was actually Jesus' marriage, and he was marrying those three women, at least according to Orson Hyde. Now, he's not necessarily an official, uh, you know, he was a Mormon apostle. So when he speaks, we listen, but uh, that wouldn't necessarily be a universal Mormon belief uh, along those lines. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the significance of the death of Christ on the cross a little later. So we'll just hold that for the moment uh, and move uh, rather to a brief conversation about how Mormons view humanity. How do they view, uh, what's the view of man? Probably the most famous statement on this came from Brigham Young, but has uh, continued to have currency in Mormonism. And it's this one, this very simple little phrase, What God once was, we are now. What God is now, we may someday be. Uh, that's the idea. That really captures it in many ways. The Mormon view that God is a being who himself started at a lower status and was exalted into, as it were, deity, and that you have the same possibility, you have the same potentiality. Uh, Mormonism is therefore at its heart a theology of salvation by deification. Uh, and at that point, I don't think there's any single point where I'd have to say there is more of a gulf fixed between Christian theology and Mormon understanding than at that point. Classical Judaism, classical Christianity have been zealous and jealous to preserve the sharp distinction between creator and creature. And there is no sense in which, no matter how intimately we may come to a fellowship with God, that we ever in that process become God. Uh, that has been uh, at the heart of a very uh, closely protected uh, idea within traditional Christian understanding. Uh, and uh, so at this point, again, I'd say there's a more or less irreconcilable tension there uh, between the two. Um, the uh, place of marriage we alluded to last week, obviously marriage has a huge uh, significance within Mormon practice and within Mormon theology. A marriage is only legal if it, is, if it takes place in the Mormon church, first of all. There are, even within the Mormon church, two different levels of marriage. There is what's called the celestial marriage and then the lesser temporal marriage. A uh, celestial marriage can only take place in a Mormon temple. Uh, that marriage is a marriage which can and should last for eternity. And uh, that pair who are married at that point have the possibility to become, as it were, spiritual, uh, uh, you know, uh, celestial uh, father and mother to a, to a whole population that would worship them. 
Uh, temporal marriages, even if they take place in the Mormon church, have a limited ability for exaltation. So many Mormons have, who have been previously married would go to the temple and be married there, you see, just to make sure that they've had that ceremony performed uh, at that, uh, in that setting. The question was asked last week, uh, what happens to an uh, unmarried woman? We were discussing that uh, women in the Mormon church have a status that is somewhat inferior to the man's. She depends on the man. He must call her secret temple name at the time of the resurrection in order for her to join him in eternity. Uh, she, in other words, depends on him. That's, that's still very much a part of Mormon instruction. What happens to a good Mormon woman who dies unmarried? Uh, is, is there some kind of ceiling, in other words, into the level, the degree to which she can be exalted under those circumstances? I uh, talked to a friend of mine who is quite an expert, much more of an expert uh, by far than I am on Mormonism, and I said that that question had come up, and you know what, what was the answer? And the guy has encyclopedic knowledge of the subject, and he immediately responded. So I'm just passing this on to you, uh, and I think it, it, it was my gut reaction, but I, I was appreciative of his uh, further insight. He said, traditionally, uh, she is simply uh, out of luck. Uh, if, if, uh, she, uh, if she dies, and no matter how uh, devoted she was to the Mormon faith, if she doesn't have that benefit of marriage in the temple... Uh, then there's no possibility for her, in terms of eternity, reaching that highest status. However, Bruce McConkie has addressed the point in his book, Mormon Theology, and he has adjusted that view slightly. And so if you want to see uh, at least what is probably contemporary speculation uh, in Mormon theology on the point, you'd want to read his book. What he says is this. He thinks that in terms of eternity there will be equity that some women who actually were married in the uh, celestial marriage nevertheless did not turn out to be worthy and their husbands may not call their names. It, it may happen that the husband does not call her name uh, because, in fact, she wasn't worthy to have her name called at the time of the resurrection. And McConkie speculates that the husband may, in fact, call some other woman to whom he was not married on earth but who was more worthy and she would be substituted in. Now, that's not official Mormon teaching. That's Bruce McConkie, but McConkie is the reigning Mormon theologian of the 20th century. So, again, when he speaks, we want to listen and take that seriously. So, I hope that at least addresses to some degree uh, that view. There's been, of course, as you know, a heavy emphasis in uh, traditional Mormonism on having many children. Polygamy, in some ways, was driven by the concern to have many children. The reason for that, frankly, is because you've got a lot of spirit children who need to get going. And, uh, and, and uh, so the uh, idea of having children and, and multiple wives and so on, in some ways, was aimed at uh, being able to give these spirit children, uh, many of them, you see, an opportunity to start the process of uh, salvation. All right. The Holy Spirit. Uh, at this point, we have a little bit of a mixed message. Uh, sometimes the Holy Spirit is called a personage. Uh, Joseph Smith will talk about the Holy Spirit on occasion as a personage. That would imply that the Holy Spirit is a person with a personality. But it seems that the more probable view right now, and, uh, and uh, this is my impression, and I think it's fairly well informed, is that the Holy Spirit is not a personality, but is more of a force. Uh, for example, uh, Orson Pratt uh, writes in a book that uh, he authored, Absurdities of Immaterialism, the following concerning the Holy Spirit, quote, No two persons can receive the same identical particles of this Spirit at the same time. A part, therefore, of the Holy Spirit will rest upon one man and another part upon another. And the idea that the Holy Spirit is sort of a, uh, a vapor, I guess you'd say, that, that can rest part of the Holy Spirit on one part on another seems to imply more of a force than some sort of uh, personal uh, being with whom you would have uh, some kind of intimate fellowship, which would be more the, uh, the idea of traditional Orthodox uh, Christianity. 
Um, again, uh, you know, you have to say to your Mormon friends uh, when they say we believe in the Trinity, you just have to examine that a little bit more closely. Well, what about the Holy Spirit? Uh, who is this Holy Spirit exactly? And I, I think as soon as you put the question under a little bit more of a, a microscope, you begin to see that there are differences there. And even though the word Trinity may be used, uh, it may not be a fair representation of the classical view of Trinity. And that's uh, really the, the point here of um, uh, thinking in those terms. Uh, as I have alluded to several times in this conversation, there is an idea that we have two sets of parents. This continues to be good Mormon teaching to this day. Uh, we were conceived of as pre-existing spirits before our birth. They have a true idea of the pre-existence of the human soul. Uh, they are not the only ones that subscribe to that idea. Plato had an idea like that. So at this point, uh, they're in good company, you know. But that has not been the traditional Christian understanding. Uh, but the pre-existence of the soul originated with the birth of these spirit children from the celestial father and mother, at which time these spirit children are in a position of waiting uh, for their possibility for physical birth. At footnote 11, uh, I make reference to this... Uh, just find it here. This is from uh, Joseph Fielding Smith, uh, and uh, he says, quote, We were all created untold ages before we were placed on this earth. Uh, man, animals, and plants were not created in the spirit at the time of creation of the earth, but long before. Uh, so we have this pre-existent uh, ex uh, life uh, existence as uh, souls or spirits, and then we're born of human parents, and begin our earthly life as such. Uh, how do you get saved? This is what's called soteriology, the doctrine of salvation. Uh, first and foremost in Mormonism, it is essential that you affirm that Joseph Smith was a prophet of God. Uh, that does continue to be a very important part of uh, Mormon teaching to this day. Brigham Young said at the Millennial Star, Volume 5, page 118, quote, Every spirit that confesses that Joseph Smith is a prophet that he lived and died a prophet, and that the Book of Mormon is true, is of God. And every spirit that does not is of Antichrist. And that would be still a, a very consistent affirmation. I've had Mormon missionaries in my living room who have been quite emphatic. You, you have to believe in your heart Joseph Smith is a prophet of God. And they will affirm they do believe that in their heart and believe they have an inner testimony to that effect, uh, notwithstanding any evidence I might be trying to shovel at them in the, in, to the contrary. Um, and I don't know if I have this opportunity to be anecdotal. I'm going to take 60 seconds and tell you this. Uh, I wasn't planning to, but I did have. This was, this was probably 25 years ago, uh, before I had seasoned and mellowed, you know. I was, uh, I was, uh, I was probably 28 years old, and I had my guns loaded for, for Mormon bear, you know what I mean? I'm embarrassed about this. I am not saying this to brag. I'm just saying it was, a, it was an experience I had. When I was probably about 28, and I had two lovely Mormon missionary young women come to the door, and, uh, and they began to tell me the story in the hopes that I would take an interest in becoming a Mormon. I listened politely for a little while. And then much to my uh, embarrassment, I have to tell you, I just kind of lost it. This is not good style, but I just really did kind of unload on them, and I had, I had been studying all of this, so I, had, I was ready to go, and I just started peppering them with questions, all kinds of questions about stuff, and they just sat there like two deer caught in the headlight of an oncoming train, you know. One of them was in tears, literally. Uh, the other one was just kind of looking at me uh, aghast. And uh, after I thought I had uh, really, you know, pretty much turned both of them into grease spots, I uh, asked them, uh, you know, if they had anything to say. And the one that was the leader between the two of them said, um, I don't know how to answer those questions. I do not know the answer. All I know is that in my heart, I'm convinced Joseph Smith was a prophet of God, you see. And that's what she came back to. And the problem is, there's no way to quite access that, you see. If that is the true conviction in the heart, uh, in spite of evidence, then in a sense, I wasn't sure where to go from that. And I have a feeling when it was all done and the, smoke and the dust settled, all I had done was train them. And um, so I'm, I, I don't recommend that. I don't think that's the way you should approach it. I'm, I'm appalled now that I would have done something like that. But it was when I was, it was before I was a Presbyterian. I was a Baptist back then. You know, so you've got, you got to give me a break. I've, I've, uh, I've kind of grown up a little bit in the meantime. 
anyway, uh, the, uh, the affirmation that Joseph Smith is a prophet of God uh, is, uh, of course, essential. Uh, but uh, there is an important place that Christ plays in salvation, but it's much more limited than, for example, we in our, our classical view would have it. Jesus died on the cross an atoning death. However, the death for which he died is restricted to the sin, uh, sorry, the sin for which he died, the sin that he atoned for, was restricted to the sin uh, related to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And even the seriousness of that sin is greatly mitigated in Mormon theology. It is viewed almost as a necessary evil that uh, they had to commit the sin in the Garden of Eden, which is usually conceived of in sexual terms, in order that this process of salvation could get underway. Had they not done so, then the whole possibility of redemption, as it's uh, described by the Mormon Church, would not be possible. But it did involve a sin. And so Christ's death is to atone for that sin, you see. So there is an atonement aspect to Jesus' death, but as I say, it has a much more limited scope that we, of course, would affirm uh, from our perspective. Uh, Fundamentally, however, in Mormonism, salvation is a function of good works. Mormonism is a religion based on the idea of living a virtuous life in order to achieve either salvation or higher states of salvation in eternity. It is a heavily works-oriented religion. Uh, At that point, it, of course, shares something in common with many religions in the world, and even some forms of Christianity have uh, drifted in that direction on many occasions. All right, just a few other points uh, quickly here. Baptism. Uh, The Mormons affirm a notion of what's called baptismal regeneration. Baptismal regeneration is the belief that baptism itself conveys the state of being born again. This, of course, is not uniquely Mormon. You would find something quite comparable to that in Roman Catholic communities, Anglican, Lutheran, and some others. Uh, so at this point, this is not any point at which we have a huge, you know, grave disagreement here. This is a, uh, there's, there's a variety of uh, Christian traditions that have the same idea. The point where baptism, of course, does depart somewhat from uh, traditional Christian teaching is the notion of multiple uh, baptisms for the dead, or proxy baptism for the dead. The idea here is that by being baptized for someone who has died, you commission a person to go and present the Mormon gospel to that deceased individual and give them the opportunity to repent and embrace the Mormon gospel and at least begin some kind of process of salvation. It is truly a religion of a second chance. If I'm wrong uh, in my presentation this morning, I'm sincerely wrong and I'm happy to report someday I will have the opportunity, hopefully, if someone will be baptized for me to make that particular response. I don't believe that's the way it's going to work out, but uh, nevertheless, I want you to realize realize that uh, many, you see, who missed the the gospel of Mormonism or died before Joseph Smith's time have that opportunity to uh, come to faith through that means. The biblical basis for that is 1 Corinthians 15.29, in which Paul says, Else why are they baptized for the dead if the dead rise not? If the dead are not raised, why are they baptized for them? A very enigmatic quote, you know, people have labored long and hired for many years trying to figure out exactly what Paul was talking about there. I'm not going to try to go into that separately. It's a, it's a, it's a puzzling text. I think there's answers to the question of what Paul was talking about. But obviously the Mormons see there a huge justification for this highly elaborate uh, program of baptism for the dead and the genealogical studies they do and so on. Uh, and of course others of their writings uh, basically expand on that quite a bit. So, um, is there anything like that in any form of traditional Christianity? The only thing I could think of would be the uh, selling of indulgences, which did have a sort of uh, idea within it of of doing something that would benefit uh, someone who had died already. Uh, Of course, Martin Luther got very upset about that when Tetzel was selling indulgences in the streets of Wittenberg and was saying, every time a coin changes a soul from purgatory springs, you know, that little chant, and that that caused Luther to write the 95 Theses and pack them on the Wittenberg door, and uh, here we are 500 years later. Uh, but uh, that, that has not been, as a rule, very uh, conspicuously part of most classic Christian teaching. The idea basically is that once you're dead, it's over. You know, 
Uh, it's given unto man once to die, and after that, judgment. That's the statement of the book of Hebrews. That does seem to foreclose an idea of second chances, further opportunities, and so on. That would be uh, pretty much the, uh, the, the traditional understanding. All right, uh, very quickly, just in the last uh, couple of minutes here, uh, Mormon eschatology, as it's called, its view of the last things. Um, there's both corporate eschatology and personal eschatology. Corporate eschatology means what's going to happen in the history of the world. Mormonism is pre-millennial, uh, if you know that word. That means they affirm that Jesus will return to earth. Joseph Smith said he would return to a region in western Missouri. And uh, that that is where the second coming would take place. This is before, the, of course, the community had moved to Utah. Uh, and that the, uh, the uh, temple would be built there. I think Mormon teaching today is more likely that Utah will be the venue for the second coming of Christ. But in any event, uh, Christ would set up an earthly kingdom and reign over it for a thousand years. This is not by any means uniquely Mormon. I think you're aware that many Christian people have a premillennial eschatology. The whole Left Behind series presupposes a premillennial eschatology. It is not traditional Presbyterian understanding. But many fine Christian people have that nevertheless, and so we wouldn't view that as some huge uh, abhorrent problem that they have a premillennial view of uh, the future. In terms of pr uh, personal eschatology, of course there's this uh, idea of gradations of exaltation. So if you do all the things you ought to do, you have a celestial marriage in the temple and otherwise participate and are good in good standing in the Mormon life and so on, uh, and then you have the possibility of realizing the celestial kingdom, that's the highest state, and the possibility actually of, of becoming, as we said earlier, a god uh, yourself. Now, there is a terrestrial kingdom, which is a lesser status, and that would be for uh, Mormon people who were not so scrupulous in their behavior or practice, or for sincere and righteous non-Mormons. There's probably a lot of Presbyterians there in that terrestrial uh, kingdom. Then there is what is called the telestial kingdom. That is for people who were really kind of unrighteous. They were not good people. Uh, it's really not even there a place of pain or punishment. It's just a more dismal region than the others that are higher. There is in Mormon theology an idea of hell. Hell is for the people who are truly wicked, the really bad ones. Uh, the Stalins and Hitlers and Genghis Khans, you know, of history that uh, have huge amounts of uh, bloodshed on their hands and so on. Uh, even their view of hell, however, is only as a temporary abode. So hell is a place where such a person would be punished for a period of time and then after that pass into annihilation. They cease to exist, they vaporize, and that's, uh, that's the end of it. All right. That's a closing remark, and my time is up, and, uh, and I've, uh, I just want to make a, a remark in passing. If at any point along the way my comments have seemed strident, harsh, condemning, I apologize, especially if you have sympathies for Mormonism. That hasn't been my intention. I hope it has helped us to understand the differences. My hope, prayer, intention is that this helps us love our Norman, uh, Mormon neighbors, friends, family more thoughtfully, more intelligently, that we can show we actually have an interest in those things that they hold dear and are prepared to engage in a conversation with them. Of course, the ulterior motive in my mind and hopefully in yours is that we win them to Christ, the Christ of the Scriptures, the Christ who is the second person of the eternal Trinity and who has been in that situation throughout all eternity and who does not change, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever and within whom there is no shadow of turning. And at that point, I think we have to say to our Mormon friends, you know, we're sorry. This is not, this is not, you see, the God that we are worshiping here, the God that you're describing who's changing and evolving. And uh, so, while I want to be loving and gracious at the same time, I don't want to sacrifice uh, what I think is the clarity of God's word, uh, uh, you know, for the sake of, of uh, a friendly conversation. So let's, let's try to keep both of those uh, in balance. Thank you all. It's uh, been a pleasure to present this to you. Let's, uh, let's have a word of prayer and we'll be dismissed. Our Father, we're grateful for the opportunity to explore these matters. We do again pray that this would uh, serve to give us uh, that loving, compassionate interest in reaching out in the name of Christ and of the Christian gospel to those who are friends and neighbors 
in such a way that we would uh, exemplify for them the very heart and grace of Christ himself. We give you thanks for it now. I ask your blessing on the service to follow, offering all these prayers in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen.